Yeah. Welcome to the third episode of season five of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday, the 27th of March, 2012. 20? Oh yeah, it's 2012. It is 2012, isn't it? And in this episode, we've got a super long interview with Richard Hughes about power management, colour management and colour hug. We will, of course, cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today, and go over your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark, and with me this week are Tony, Laura, and Alan. Yay! Hello. Hiya! Hello, everybody. Tony. Hello, Mark. What have you been up to since the last show? Um, Very excitingly, I went to the official Doctor Who convention. Well, that's most unlike you. (laughs) (laughs) This is the second convention I've been to in about 15 years. It just so happens that I've been to in quite close succession. But it was the official one. It was really good. It had lots of good access to famous people. Uh, I had had my photograph taken with uh, Karen Gillan, the uh, actress who plays Amy Pond. Cool. I might just leave that. <laughs> oh He's my! Got it here. Oh golly! That look you can see on her face is actually her trying to restrain herself. Do you know what's what's I lovely about the way you've positioned that is that there's a nice mug in front of your face, <laughs> yeah. and all I can see is Karen Gillan, which is good. That's the best way around, isn't it? But yes, she was very friendly. That, that is That's just a great bitch. <laughs> she is just trying to restrain us. The security guard was there for my protection, not hers. He was about the fiftieth person to have that picture taken with her. Oh, that. bless her! It was the end of a long day. Oh, was it good fun? <laughs> it was very good fun. It yes. was. We went and, to see the TARDIS. See, I didn't know you were going, and then on Facebook, I saw some pictures pop up. Um, because I'm, you know, I'm a, I like Doctor Who. And I saw some pictures come up, and I thought, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> In the queue. Yeah, that's first. Tony's back in that yes. photo. It's worrying that you know my back. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on, Laura. Other than going to a Doctor Who convention, uh, what have uh, you been up to? Oh, I've been feeling a tiny little bit guilty that I really, really want a Kindle because it is so closed and. Proprietary. Oh, you mean a, you mean an Amazon swindle? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But then I get over it because it is so nice to use the app, the Kindle store and stuff. So yeah. So are you getting one? Have you got one? No, I want one for my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fingers crossed. <laughs> I gave mine to Sophie because yeah, we were bad parents, bad parents, and left her in a situation where she had didn't have any books to read. Oh. She, well, she's got loads of books, but she'd run out and she'd read everything and. And she said, oh, I want something to read. And it was bedtime. I said, I know. So I went and got the Kindle and went, what do you want to read? And I bought a book there and then and just wow. handed it to her. And she sat and read the book. And Daddy, next book. So I bought a bunch of books for her on the Kindle and she loves it. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> I can see why people like them. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Alan, what have you been doing? I've been testing. What have you been testing? Are you allowed to tell us? Everyone's patience. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What, again? (laughs) Uh, Unity, Compiz, Unity 2D, all of that stuff, all that good stuff. So it turns out we've got this tool called Checkbox, and it's been adapted, um, and there's a version called Checkbox Unity that's in one of the Unity PPAs. And when you run it, it takes you through a bunch of screens and there's loads and loads of tests that you can do. And it, it basically says, right, now do this, press this button and move the mouse here. And this is what should happen. Does it happen? And you get three options. Yes, no, and skip. And you you can do skip if it's not appropriate or you don't have the hardware to do the test. And then there's a little box where you can fill in comments. And there's two things. One, I found a, you know, a fair number of bugs mm-hmm. in, in the various releases of Unity. But the other thing is, I learned loads about how it's supposed to behave because the tool actually documents exactly what's supposed to happen. So sometimes I, I press stuff and I think, well, why did that happen? And I don't remember pressing a button that did that. And then the little tool, if you just go through the tests, you actually learn exactly how the interface is supposed to behave. It's brilliant. It's like documentation. It's really good. So yeah, that's been good fun. I never thought testing could be so interesting. <laughs> how about you, Mark? Um, I restored something from a backup. Well, hey, <laughs> which on your personal I, cloud. I couldn't say that a year ago. <laughs> um, and I also got fed up with my phone and decided to install CyanogenMod on it. Because it's been running HTC Sense for the past two years and it was full of stuff. Well, okay, it wasn't full of stuff. It was telling me it was full of stuff and it had a load of stuff which came with the phone, which I didn't want and couldn't remove. Right. So I decided it was time to... Uh, refresh it a bit it's an htc what it's an htc legend 
Right. Which no one has <laughs> and other than me. <laughs> was it fairly straightforward to flash? It was because HTC provide tools to unlock the bootloader. Oh, and that's kind of them. You just run a command line tool to say flash a recovery image um, and then tell the recovery image to um, install a different system. Nice. Yeah. And is, uh, what, is it faster or just more clean um, Google out of the box experience? No, it's not. Well, it's it's sort of stock Android, but then tweaked and shinied up a bit. And it sort of it feels like what Android is supposed to feel like, rather than you know what right. some designers thought it might be nice if it looked like sort of right. thing. Um, yeah, so it's it's sort of not got any stuff that's been added by the the networks or by the handset manufacturers but then it's got some like you it's got loads of tweaks so you can do things like um you know you were talking i think it was in the last season about a thing called flux which changed the temperature of your monitor yes. when it went tonight you can have a mode for that on your phone <laughs> um and you know you can there's tools for overclocking if you want to do things like that All right, and cool. you've got root access if you need to run any fancy programs and stuff like that so yeah it's really cool <sighs> yeah I managed to take a screenshot of my home screen on my phone, and what? that's not possible. What phone is no, it? You see, you see on Sign Engine Mod, you hold down the power button and you press screenshot. Exactly. Brilliant. But it's not it's not possible without using a, like a thing with root access and stuff. What phone have you got? Uh, uh, HTC, uh, the purple one that's like a desire. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a desire, but it's not. Bless you, Laura. Anyway, but um, yeah. It's not possible because I spent ages looking for an app that Did would do it. you take a photo of your phone in the end? Well, you, <laughs> you kind of say that. I had the camera running at the time, but how can the camera that points out the back... Did you have a mirror? ...take a picture <laughs> of the screen perfectly? Did you have three mirrors? I'll show you afterwards. <laughs> Did you have a periscope? Is yeah, that what that's what it was. Right, well, we've had to rearrange things in this episode to fit in this super long interview with Richard Hughes. So it's all going to be a bit fly-by-wire. We shall uh, we shall hope it goes okay, and we'll see you at the other end of it. But uh, now we're going to get on with the news. And here are the news. Features from Android's fork of the Linux kernel have begun making their way into the mainline kernel as of version 3.3. This should bring the advantages of Android's modifications to the kernel to other Linux platforms, while making it easier for Android to keep its changes in sync with the upstream project. And I'll still essay on the whole point of forks and merging there. Any idea what those, adv- those advantages are? No, not a clue. Right. Something to do with... I don't know. I think something I read said something about multitasking and things like that. It's another fantastically well researched news article on the Ubuntu. <laughs> you <podcast>. read it? <laughs> I only read it. I didn't write it. I just hope I know what I'm talking about in mine. I don't. <clears throat> no, me neither. There's another humble bundle on sale, and Linux users are paying the most. Yay! Again. Has anyone bought it? Nope. Yes, as always. Is it good? Uh, well, aside from a few of the games not working out the box on yeah. Linux, which annoyed me a bit. Um, I had, yeah, one of them wouldn't work, but I asked a question on Ask Ubuntu and said, I'm trying to play this game and it doesn't work. Here's the output. Someone's given me a reply, edit this any file and turn think, something off and it works and it's brilliant. Cool. And it's called Zenbound 2 and it's really weird. You have this wooden model in front of you and at one end there's a rope tied to it and with the mouse you can rotate the model and the idea is to wrap the rope around <laughs> the model and cover as much of the model as you possibly can. It's brilliant. It's really simple, and you're just rotating something. But the rope like slips off and stuff if you oh, tilt it too much. Furious. It is. It's really good. It's really and actually quite relaxing. It's got a, like the whole Zen thing. It's uh, yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> worth worth a punt. Uh, the open source video editor Caden Live has launched a donation drive on Indiegogo in order to source funds for a major refactor of the project's code. The drive seeks to employ one of the project developers for a full time for two months, resulting in a cleaner and more stable code base that will make it easier to contribute to the project. The campaign reached its funding target with 40 days to go. Wow. Yeah, That's pretty cool. That's very but, good. But the amount they were asking for wasn't actually an awful lot. Something like $4,000? Was it as much as that? Yes, it was $4,000. Uh, and awesome. they've now reached 5436 And they've cool. got 34 days to go now. For two, for two yeah, months, so, that, so that's, you know, a couple of pot noodles a day. That'll keep <laughs> yeah, it going. it's not a tremendous amount, but, you know, it's motivation for someone to do some work, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. 
Nouveau, the open source graphics driver for NVIDIA chipsets with hardware acceleration support, has been merged into the mainline Linux kernel. For the first time, the project has also released its drivers in sync with the hardware they're designed for. What does that mean, Mark? <laughs> Basically, NVIDIA released a new card, and when NVIDIA released a new card, they obviously released their binary proprietary drivers with it. And on the same day, Nouveau managed to add support for the same card to their driver like within minutes that's within really, hours that's really unusual normally you know in the past it was oh you need to send us a card we need to analyze exactly. the dumps and yeah so, so a guy at red hat apparently it's, it's, it was only sort of basic sort of mode setting support but he managed to add it pretty much straight away which came after last week we were talking about nvidia joining the linux foundation yeah this is good yeah. so perhaps yeah. they uh, are actually getting stuck in yeah you never know I do hope so That's saving again. everybody from analysing those dumps in an <laughs> unexpected turn of events proprietary educational software Blackboard uh, software provider Blackboard has acquired two companies providing commercial services for Moodle a competing open source virtual learning environment and employed child Dr Chuck Severance who was heavily involved in development of the Saki collaboration and learning environment Sakai Sakai Saki sounds more like more fun to me, which is also open source. In a blog post, the president of Blackboard Learn spoke of embracing open source through a multi-platform product ladder. Multi-platform product, product ladder. ladder. That means get them in the open source and then <laughs> upgrade them to the proprietary stuff later. Is that what that means? Yes, yeah, so or buy out the people who are competitors and then they'll stop working on... Hmm. This isn't. He didn't buy out the whole of the competitors. This is like Moodle is owned by a uh, trust and then they have partner companies who fund the development. They bought two of the partner companies, basically. So, Ouch. so it hasn't taken over Moodle. It's just made a massive hole in their development uh, capability. Well, that's a bit rude. That's only if it stops them developing it, which they say they go they want to buy these companies because they want to get involved in open source development. Yeah, and apparently they've got really nice wallpaper in those companies as well. They really <laughs> need to get their hands on the wallpaper. <laughs> so, yeah, let's hope that they do an IBM rather than an Oracle. Yes. And that's all the news. And we've got some events. The Ohio Linux Fest is in Columbus, Ohio on the 28th to the 30th of September. And you can find out more at ohiolinux.org slash CFP. I'd like to tell you about Bar Camp Canterbury. Go on, the then. event is a two-day bar camp on innovative slash fun uses of technology and will run on the 28th and 29th of April, that's not too far away, at the University of Kent in Canterbury, which is only about an hour out of London on the high-speed train. Thank you for that travel <laughs> tip there, Tony. <laughs> that, is, that is calling at. <laughs> <laughs> and two days before that, there's the UK Ubuntu release party at Bar Soho in London, I assume. Yes, it is. On yeah, a Thursday in London. Yes. So I won't be going. Well, that's the release day, because we always release on a Thursday, you see. Yeah. Why? How convenient. Uh, do you know what? I don't know. Friday would be far more convenient for us. No, I, th <laughs> I think there's a good reason why we don't do that, but I haven't got a clue what that reason is. Okay. Also, Og Camp is Hooray! happening. What? This is our thing. Gasp. Yes. We're organising Og Camp again this year. And uh, this year, we're back in Liverpool at a different venue. We're going to be at the Art and Design Academy, part of Liverpool John Moore University, on the 18th and 19th of August. And we'll have details of speakers, accommodation, extreme ironing 2.0 mm. uh, later. Uh, you can check all the details on our website, ogcamp.org. And remember to scroll down. So <laughs> I love the fact that somebody's felt the need to you put Liverpool John Moore University then in brackets in Liverpool. <laughs> Just in case there's any doubt. <laughs> so the no. important thing to notice and get in your calendars straight away is the 18th and 19th of August. Yep. Yes. yes. And when you say about accommodation, um, we're yes. actually going to have a recommended We're going to have a recommended hotel um, and um, all kinds of um, other information on the website. Excellent work, Og Camp people. <laughs> Anything more to say on it? Um, not yet. More to come Excellent. in the following weeks. Okay. Hello. And welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire. 
In today's look at tomorrow's technology today, which we recorded yesterday, we'll be telling you about all sorts of technology you can expect tomorrow, or the day after that. First off, news from the Imperial Victor Motor Company of Sutton Coldfield. They tell us that by the year 2000, we shall all be owning the driverless motor car, a high-speed vehicle capable of self-navigation. From your home to your place of work, and any destination betwixt and between, you will be able to sit in total comfort, smoking your favorite pipe, safe in the expectation of an incident and accident-free journey, without any danger of collision or indeed death. So, you can give the car key to the good lady wife without worrying if they'll both make it home. Splendid! And on the home front, please welcome our doyen of the domestic, Deirdre Morris Oxford. Hello, Deirdre. Hello, Douglas. So, Deirdre, what spectacle of tomorrow's technology today have you for us today? Here's something I found yesterday. It's a new type of dustbin. The dustbins are hardly new, Deirdre. This one is a dustbin on wheels, Douglas. It's likely to be called a wheelie bin. It means the lady of the house can remove the rubbish to the street without disturbing the man of the house so he can continue to sit about in his slippers, smoking his favorite pipe and be generally useless without having to worry about his domestic duties. What a spiffing, labor-saving device, Deirdre. Unless you happen to be the lady of the house, Douglas. And that's as maybe, Deirdre. Well, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. Uh, today. A toodle pip and God save the king. I can't believe I gave up research in theoretical physics for this. This... Rubbish, Deirdre? Oh. delighted to have on the phone uh, the lovely Richard Hughes. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hi, very good. Thank you. Cool. Um, now, some people may not. You're one of the unsung heroes of our Linux desktop, and uh, people probably don't know um, the stuff that you're kind of responsible for. So give us, give us a rundown of some of the stuff people might have touched that uh, were created by your hands. Um, I guess it's start, I'll start from the top. I guess I started with UPower and Known Power Manager. Then moved into package kit, and then known package kit, and then moved into color D, uh, and then all the color stuff. So shared color profile, shared color targets, known color manager, and that kind of took me to the whole color hug thing as well. So, so did you do all this as part of your employment at Red Hat, or was this before you started, or how did, how did that all work? Out? Well, at university, I started doing the whole U Power thing. I started stuffing the kernel, stuffing user space. Um, I think uh, Power Manager was also at uni as well. Uh, and then after uni, I went to work for a defence contractor. Uh, and everything went a bit quiet, open source-wise. So Red Hat said to me, look, do you want to work on cool stuff in open source? And I kind of jumped at the chance. So ever since then, I've been a, a, a programmer for the desktop group based in London. Excellent. And what sort of stuff are you working on at the moment in your, in your day job? As part of, like, desktop, it's quite broad. Are you, are you still focused on the stuff that you mostly created? Um, yes and no. At the moment, the last few weeks, have been sort of, the big push has been on GNOME 3, uh, 3.4. So I've been building hundreds of packages and fixing stuff up and sort of the last sort of push before the big release. So we've, I've been spending a lot of time with Bugzilla and email and all that kind of stuff. Usually I can tend to concentrate on the stuff that I've either built or built with other people. So, like recently, I've spent a lot of time on Color D. I've spent a lot of time on Package Kit and that kind of thing. Is that is that common within Red Hat that you you have like your own pet packages, but also you get pulled in at a busy time to to work on other stuff and and help you know get the release out the door, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I guess so. I think from most people's point of view, I guess they've got one thing that they're good at, so printing or color or um, databases or whatever. You know, so there's always one thing they're good at. And I don't think, no one really tells us what to do. So it's, <laughs> case of, it's more of a case of people offer to help out, and it's different people on different teams say, okay, well, we should probably focus on this now. And if you've got a few spare cycles, you just sort of, you sort of push things along a bit. So it, it, it's a bit more sort of ad hoc than a, a big man with a, a, 
uh, organizational chart saying you do this, you do that. Right. It's a bit more, a bit more sort of freeform than that. And and what made you, what motivated you to to look at things like power management and um, color management and package management? What 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 drives you to to look at those things, which some people might consider, you know, very dull and uninteresting? I guess. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I guess ultimately I'm kind of scratching an itch. So, so like for a typical example is the colour one. So like a couple of years ago I bought a DSLR, the Nikon D60. Started taking photos and kind of found out quite quickly that I wasn't very good at it. Mm-hmm. So for my wife, uh, uh, for my birthday, my wife bought me a, a camera course at the local college. Oh, nice. Went to the camera course, um, used OSX, used Colour Sync, used Photoshop and thought, wow, this just works. There's no sort of tweaking things to make them look right. There's no compiling, there's no configuring <laughs> random text files. And then I went to try to do like almost like the homework on my Linux machine and it just fell miserably. It was completely wrong. All the printouts came out the wrong colour, everything looked wrong on the screen. And I thought, well, nobody's doing this. Nobody's actually done this, so maybe I need to do it. And that's where ColorD and then Color Manager came from. Right. So give me the, for people who've never clicked that beautiful icon in their control panel, <laughs> what, what does it actually do? Okay. Color management is one of those things that the more you understand, the more you realize you don't understand anything. <laughs> um, so basically, color management is all about taking a color from a source device, like a scanner, uh, a camera, or something like that, showing it on a, a display device, like a CRT screen or an LCD screen with the same color, and then printing it out with the same color. And there's lots of problems, like you, you can take a photo um, with a digital DSLR and you can encode millions and millions of colours, but the screen's just not capable. You can't show fluorescent yellow on a screen. And so you have to kind of manage the user's expectation and try to make things look okay-ish with the limits of the technology you've got. And also when you print stuff out, you might not be able to print because obviously your, your screen's in red, green, blue pixels, but your printer might only have sign, magenta, yellow and perhaps a couple more and so you you can't print some colors you've got to try and say to the user okay well this is the closest i can get by tweaking these colors so the hard bit is making this stuff just work without the user sitting there looking at random color diagrams (laughs) trying to work out what all these random numbers mean right and and is that and so you have some system i have clicked the button and i i did wonder what it was and i didn't didn't really get very far you 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 take some kind of um, representation of color and, and try and standardize it across all the devices? How, how does it manage that? Basically, each device, so uh, display device, input device, output device, they all have to have a profile. So all the profile tells the system is what this device is capable of doing. So what kind of color range can the printer print? What kind of color range can the camera capture? And from that, we can work out how we need to change the, the pixel values to make it display the right thing. So a good example might be I've got a, a, a laptop, a T510, a Lenovo thing, and everything looks very blue. So if you look at it long enough, everything is, well, the background's blue, the, even the reds are a bit purpley. And using the color, uh, using the, once we've calibrated it, we can make the screen less blue and actually make the screen white like it should be. Oh, I had never noticed that. that uh, you probably won't. If you, if, the only time you'll look at it is when you see the difference. So your eyes are very good at something called chromatic adaption. So that if you look at something that's blue for long enough, it looks white. In the same way that if you've got like the Financial Times in the UK, the the pink paper, and you look at it for long enough, you stop seeing the fact that it's pink, you start seeing white, your eyes have adjusted to the colour. Okay. So like for a a random anecdote, I went to a conference a couple of years ago and calibrated one of the, uh, I won't won't name them, but one of the designers for GNOME, I calibrated their screen and instantly went from being blue to white. And he, he, the guy looked at me and he said, every single icon I've drawn in the last two years has been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> people don't know, your eyes are a really bad calibration device. So it's like when you're listening to a lot of voices in a, cloud, in a crowded room and you pick out one, but sure. with your eyes instead. Well, I, I go to conferences and you see people and they're displaying all these pictures of photos they've taken in random places around the world. And I just look at the images and I'm crying. <laughs> it must wrong, kill you. you know? <laughs> wow. So what do you have to do to get your monitor uh, calibrated on uh, Ubuntu, for example, or any other known environment? Okay. The easiest, well, basically, the easiest thing to do is go out and buy some hardware. 
If you go and buy a, a, a color emitter, which they're about sort of 100 quid, uh, 100, uh, about $150 or something, or you can go and buy a spectrophotometer, and they're quite a lot more expensive. They're kind of five, 600 pounds. All that really does is it measures the color that the screen's actually producing. So you basically put this little device on the screen, <coughs> excuse me, and it says, this is the exact XYZ color that is being produced when the computer thinks it's doing this color. So by doing lots and lots of measurements, we can actually say, okay, well, when the computer says per this purple is too blue, so when, the computer wants to, when we want to display this purple, take a little bit away from the blue color. So right. we can fill up this profile for the screen that lets us show the right colors. And is that is that something you would have to do per model? So, like, all of the ThinkPad X220s would be the same color representation and all of the System76 machines would be different because they're a different panel? I'd and... love that if that was true. <laughs> right. The problem is, from someone that's got dire experience of sitting on a C61 and smashing the screen, <laughs> uh, I can tell you there's about four or five different panel manufacturers on two different continents in four different factories. So every single manufacturer of the, of the panel has a slightly different um, set of uh, dyes in, in the screen, has a different um, colour of the backlight, and the screens are very different. So that's one big problem. The second big problem is that the screens change as they get older. So you might have noticed that your screen gets a bit dimmer as it gets mm, older. Yeah. But it also gets more yellow as it gets older. Mm-hmm. And also, even if, you, even if you've got a CRT or a plasma, the phosphors degrade the more you use them, and so the number of colours you can display gets less. So if you're a, like a proper colour geek and you're working for like one of the studios like Pixar or Disney, then you're recalibrating the screen sort of every sort of eight weeks, maybe even 12 weeks, 12 weeks, eight weeks, because colour is so critical to your sort of your workflow that the fact the screen is changing is a big, big deal. Right. And, and you know, the, the traditional thinking that I hear is that Apple have this working quite well on all of their displays and that's one reason why people use them and... You know, every other manufacturer is is different. Is that is that actually not the case, and they need to be recalibrated just as much as everyone else? Apple have a massive advantage in that they control all the hardware, so they can say that all the displays come from this factory, and all the factories created on this day at this factory can be shipped with a, a known profile that we know what it is. Right. So if you turn on an OS X box and you go into the displays uh, color stuff, it has a unique color profile for your display for that batch for that model number, etc. Wow. So they've already got 90% of the way there. The fact that their screens are kind of the premium end of screens anyway means that when they degrade, they don't degrade that much. And so if you've got a, a MacBook that's less than a couple of years old, it's usually pretty accurate on color. Right. Okay. So, so you mentioned hardware, and I understand that in your spare time, you, you work on a piece of hardware yourself. Um, what, what motivated you to do that, to create the color hug? I guess mainly... Um, I've been spending the last couple of years working on making all the software stack right. So right away from the bottom is ColorD and Gnome Color Manager and ColorD KDE, etc. And people were asking me how to calibrate my screen. And I was saying, well, the first thing you have to do to calibrate your Linux open source system is go and spend £200 with a proprietary color company like Panton. Right. And it didn't seem right saying to people that they have to spend all this money on such a simple device to do something as simple to make their screen less blue. And when you say a simple device, what, what actually, I've seen the, the device, it's quite tiny, so there can't be that much in it. Uh, right in it. What, what is in it? A little, de- a little device that I came up with basically has a little colour chip in it, which has, I think it's a 16 red, 16 blue, 16 green little pixels, and it measures the exact colour that's coming through. So each, each patch that comes up on the screen, like a set of red patch comes up on the screen, the colour sensor will have a, a frequency output that's dependent on the um, uh, uh, the sorry the color the frequency will be dependent on the, the brightness of that color. Yeah. So by measuring these, these all three pixels, we can say exactly what color it is. Okay. All we then have to do is couple a very high speed frequency counter and a USB interface, and that's essentially a color device. Yeah. So all I really did was stick a, a a light to frequency chip on the bottom of a, a a PIC uh, microcontroller and stuck a USB interface in it. It's a really simple device. And have you got any background in electronics, or was this, you know, you went out and got the data sheets and figured it out for yourself and just built one? Well, I did go out and figure it out myself, but it did help that I had a couple of years' experience working in microelectronics for a defence contractor. <laughs> so that kind of helped a little bit. I, right. the, when I was working there, I was working on a lot of um, surface mount rework on some of the 
cool programs and stuff. Right. So I, I had quite an experience prototyping PCBs and that kind of stuff. And what, what tools did you use for, for creating the PCBs? What, um, what software? and? Well, I used GA, GEDA, the um, free um, PCB suite. And initially I was kind of, uh, I, I thought, the idea of learning a new suite, because I'd already learned mental graphics so when I was working at the defense company. But comparing the two, GEDA was so much simpler than mental graphics. It yeah. couldn't do the whole traceability thing that you need in a big company, but it was so much easier to prototype. It's so much easier to actually see on the screen what you were doing. Um, and then all the other diagrams and stuff was all like Scribus and Inkscape. Um, that's about it, really, I think. Right. It's an amazingly compact little device. It's about the size of um, a matchbox, which is a useful re reference for those of you living in the Victorian age. We should say at this point, Tony is holding one of these in his hand. Yes. It's like a compact flash size, isn't it? Yeah, a bit thicker than that. But it's, it's pretty small. Um, I think it's about 32 millimetres by 43 millimetres by 21 millimetres. <laughs> <laughs> Just approximately. Roughly. That's, that's about right. With a nice colourful sticker on the back, a USB, a mini, uh, mini USB outlet at the top, and a little hole with a rubber uh, beat grommet around it uh, on, on the uh, underside. If you, and if you want to see how clever it is, take the back off, take the screws out, and then see the circuit board. The circuit board is crammed in there. Um, Ooh, I can't see any screws. Oh, take the little pads off, take the little foam oh. pads off at the back. <laughs> We're going to do a live <laughs> distraction of home. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a we'll screwdriver. Here we come. I've got one here. <laughs> so you've written the, the calibration software that goes with it, that does the frequency analysis? Yes, I wrote with the firmware. The firmware itself is kind of like, I guess it's beta. This is why the unit I've been... The, the unit I'm not really making much profit on at the moment, because it's all a beta, beta thing. Mm -hmm. So the firmware kind of works well enough. We still need to spend loads of time, but... It's one of those chicken and egg things. I want people to help me with the firmware who know what they're doing, but they can't help me with the firmware until they've got a device themselves. Right. Mm. So I've written like a, almost like a reference implementation. I'm hoping someone's going to come in with like a, I don't know, PhD in signal, um, signal processing and saying you're doing this all wrong, here's what you should be doing, here's the patch. Right. So that's kind of what I'm hoping. So then I wrote um, some client tools which let you replace the firmware on the device. The, the device actually has like two layers of firmware. One's like a bootloader, which means everything goes wrong and you try and try to flash um, and there's a random doc, .doc file into your colour hug and brick it. <laughs> the bootloader just lets you boot it and lets you recover from it. It's basically un unbrickable. That sounds like a challenge. Well, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Warranty non-void. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, must say, I haven't managed to get this uh, working to actually produce a, a profile for my monitor yet, um, but I was able to upgrade the firmware quite quickly, and you provide a, a Fedora-based live CD with the developer kit, oh, nice. um, which has got most of the tools that you need to get up and running it's with it. It's quite a conscious decision to provide a whole live CD, because Linux is this massive fragmented thing. If I was providing a, a Windows drive, I could sort of ship one DLL file and a couple of imp files, and I'd be a way to go on any system. OS X, I guess, similar. But with Linux, people have got, like, random PCs with Debian mixed with Gen 2 on the same system, and <laughs> it's all a bit crazy. Yeah. There's, like, uh, Ubuntu running one thing, Fedora running another thing, different UDev, we've got System D, we've got all sorts of stuff going on everywhere. So if I, if I can send everyone a CD that I know works with the hardware, when they come back to me and say, it doesn't work on my system, I can say, well, does it work with the live CD? Yes. Well, then it's your system. <laughs> <laughs> so if they create a profile using the live CD, well, then will that then work for their device on any GNOME desktop? Yes. So an I, there's, there's a profile it creates is called an ICC profile, mm -hmm. and that can even be used in Windows and OS X. Oh, cool. The trick is you've got to copy it off the live CD. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's a KDE. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I saw it working KDE. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yes, only recently. There was, um, Daniel has been working on a Color D KDE front end. Oh, cool. Um, which is, I think it's just had its first release last week. So it's still a bit raw around the edges, but it basically works as one of the GNOME tools without the calibration stuff yet. Cool. So are you actually making these things yourself in your spare time, you know, in your weekends and evenings? Well, I kind of promised my wife I was only going to make 50. How many um, have you made? <laughs> well, I made 50 in the first, well, I put, I put a blog post up saying I don't want to make 50, so I'm going to be left with loads of spare. So I put a blog post up, and that evening I got about 200 people. <laughs> that so might have been when I, we announced that. Sorry? Yeah. We, that we, might have been when we announced we it, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, that was helpful, so thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that evening, uh, that, that week, 
was, I, I sat down, I was literally soldering them by hand. So the first 50 units were hand soldered, wow. um, either underneath the scope or freehand. So that was kind of, that was kind of fun. Uh, then I decided that actually I couldn't do this, otherwise I'd go insane, uh, because Saturday became Colour Hug Day. Um, so I've now got a distributor that will solder the units for me, like a, a PCB fabricator to call themselves. So right. you basically drop off all the parts to them. They pick and place it all on board. So you pick it up a week later and you pay them for their privilege. You sound like you're having the same trouble Raspberry Pi are having at the moment. <laughs> well, it's really, hard, it's really easy to make five of something. Like the first five um, colour hugs I really enjoyed doing. That's I, funny because the one we've got numbered is number five. Oh, there we so go. So it all went was, downhill from there. Exactly. <laughs> Once you get to about 45, you go from enjoying the soldering because you haven't got soldered in ages to I hate soldering. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so now the fabricator has kind of taken over. So I've dropped off a batch of 200 PCBs last week and hopefully I'll get them back this week uh, and then I can start putting them in boxes. I say, I say putting them in boxes myself. Uh, actually, it's my wife that sticks the stickers on, <laughs> sticks the feet on, and does all the sort of like the uh, basic bits. It's proper homebrew. This is isn't it, it is completely homebrew. Excellent. And and have you had much feedback from the community? Have you had many you know bug reports and uh, contributions? Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. The firmware tools people have already started packing because the firmware is kind of sort of hardcore to get into. Um, and people have been adding features and stuff. What I'm waiting for is more the colour geeks to get involved. Like, I've got Graham, um, who's the Argyle CMS maintainer. He's given me loads of advice on how to improve the, like, the black readings and that kind of thing. So it's really great that he's, I've, uh, he's got one and he's helping me uh, with it at the moment. Um, with, the, with the tools, the GNOME um, uh, uh, the design team have been really good in designing the firmware uploader, um, LAPO, et cetera. Um, the CCMX loader is also designed by them as well. So, yeah, everyone's kind of got involved because they know what I'm doing. I'm not trying to make a massive profit out of this. Yeah. I'm, 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 last, like, last week, I was the first time I could pay myself any money for my time. Um, so I think my, the average, I've paid myself so far for my time something like 20p an hour or something. Oh, my um, my. But hopefully, now I'm producing more modules, I can afford to pay myself and maybe the minimum wage. Golly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, 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 people have been helping a lot. And I think... The more units I produce now, the more I can start to make a little trickle of profit that can, I can use to speed up the other batches. Yeah, that would be good. So are there any, are there any people that you think you should be reaching out to and sending like review units to? Um, at the moment, I'm trying not to because I don't want this to be too popular because I'm, <laughs> I'm limited at the moment by how many I can produce. Right. If I, if I sent out loads of review units and got a job, like when I got a review from Ars Technica a few weeks ago, I think I doubled the number of people on the waiting list in a couple of days, wow. which was great, but it then meant that people had to wait sort of like four or five weeks for hardware. Yeah. And we live in like an Amazon point click deliver generation, and people don't really want to wait six, seven weeks for hardware. Well, Linux geeks are probably a bit more forgiving, I would yeah, have thought. I agree with that to, to a point, but then you still get the email saying, Hi, am I still on the mailing list? Am I still, on the, am I still in the queue? You did right. see the reaction on Raspberry Pi release day, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, Raspberry Pi was fantastic. Well, it sounds really good, but yeah. I think that's like, a, that's like two orders of magnitude different to me. <laughs> <laughs> so if people did want to join your lengthy uh, list and uh, wanted to get involved and help you out in some way, where's the best place for them to go? Where do you hang out? I, well, at the moment, we're hanging out on the mailing list. We've got a colour hub dash users mailing list. Just stick to Google. Um, and there's quite a little community there of people who either brick their devices and want help to recover them or people that want to help develop the firmware or change icons and this kind of random stuff. Or uh, That's kind of where we discuss stuff. Uh, I, sorry, Tony's shouting at me and I don't know what I he's saying. I just said power. <laughs> I don't know why. Power management. Yeah. That's the other thing that you're involved in, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, I guess powers and packages as well. Um, power is one of those things I did quite a long time ago, so I thought of then you get kernel stuff, then user space, device kit power, then became view power. And in the last GNOME 3.2 cycle, we moved all the GNOME power manager stuff into the settings daemon. So we had a bit of a chance to sort of like take all the code, rip out all the craft, keep the bit that made sense, and get rid of an awful lot of lines of code, um, modernizing it. And do you, is there a lot of interaction between the the power management stuff that's been done in the kernel and the stuff like UPower and uh, no power manager. Yes, but by, more by coincidence than planning. It seems to have settled out like Matthew Garrett's a really cool, clever guy. Yeah. He 
tends to focus more on the kernel power management stuff, and I tend to take the user space stuff. But we, we have to cross over because there's stuff in the kernel that's telling user space, and also user space has to tell the kernel stuff as well. So we, we talk fairly regularly, but it's, it's more of an ad hoc, I've broken your interface, here's a patch to fix the interface type <laughs> thing. What sorts of things are in user space as opposed to kernel space? So, for instance, some of the um, like PMQoS stuff, which is the quality of service for power management, so you can control um, disk latencies and that kind of thing. That's in the user space because it requires policy from each application. Um, we've also there's the user space is an, that's like a nice abstraction, so rather than having to query lots of stuff in this uh, class battery and random hid devices and USB USB cables. We've got a nice USB uh, bus interface that applications can just query and wait for change events and all that kind of stuff. It's also a really good place in user space to stick all the random qu uh, quirks. <laughs> what what do you mean by quirks? <laughs> well, for instance, like um, uh, uh, UPS devices that charge up to 120% and that kind of thing. Oh. Is it? Uh, or um, wireless mice that uh, charge to 7% out of 100, that kind of thing. Right, okay. <laughs> So, oh, so, okay, so you get bug reports from people saying my ma it's showing the wrong percentage for my device, and then you have to add a quirk that says, well, actually, that thing never reaches 100 or always goes over 100 or something. Yes. Normally what happens is that we try to push the quirks down into either UDEV or even the kernel. So a lot of, a lot of the time it's a case of me pushing stuff like random stuff into UDEV so that we can abstract it one layer higher. Right. Um, so it, but basically the... The, for a long, long time, I was developing HAL, and HAL basically picked up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bodges in this user space system daemon. And we weren't really fixing the core issues, which was that the kernel was telling us the wrong values. Mm. So when we sort of depreciated HAL and tried to split everything out into its own subsystem daemons, we really tried to push all the bodges back down into the kernel where we could do them in like a, more of a sane place. Right. So the user space stuff, we only really working around where there's like uh, an, an application we have to deal with rather than a device we have to deal with. Cool. Makes sense. To be honest, power management stuff kind of split, settled down. It's, it's not in the, uh, back in the days, it was when they had PROC and all this random stuff, and then Sys, SysFS came in. Now it's kind of a stable kernel interface, so there's a lot less to do from my point of view, and really it's more working on the UI and making the designers happy or try, trying to make them more happy I should say <laughs> <laughs> so is it, is the power management stuff is pretty much sorted other than at the kernel level you know trying to eke as many watts out of a laptop that we possibly can in the in the user side user space side of it there's there's not so much you can do with a battery gauge is yes there? I agree um, with the, the only thing we can tell with any things we can tell from the user space is basically tell the kernel some hints so um good example saying you want a minimum throughput so you don't so for instance if you've got a, a hard disk you might have a, um, a a link speed now in the kernel the kernel can automatically slow the link speed from your hard disk to the um, main board um, but in doing so it's basically to use this power but in doing so you lower your throughput but you might say to the kernel actually my minimum throughput this is a web server and my minimum throughput has to be very high so don't throttle down so we still have these interactions where the, the, we have to tell the kernel policy through an abstraction, which is UPAM. Right. So, so on you know on a Windows environment, people are used to having a little battery button and then like a zillion options where they can tweak and fiddle and people feel that they have some control over the power management of their system. And we don't really have that in Linux, do we? It's kind of you're, yes. you're either on the battery or you're on mains. But Good we luck. can do a lot better than what we do what they do on Windows. The advantage we've got in Linux is we have control of the entire stack, so we can we can change stuff in the kernel, in the subsystem daemon, in the user space to make stuff work. So we can as a, now I think for the first time we can consume less power on Linux on some machines than we can in Windows because we can do things. So a good example, for instance, like when the APIs were split into glibc to be able to do. Um, uh, sleeping on seconds. So if I say I've got a timer that I want to fire, so I want, say I want to update the screen every 60 seconds. Right. Now I don't care whether I update the screen 59 seconds or 61 seconds. It's a mm. completely rough, arbitrary number of seconds. So I don't need to wake up the computer exactly on 60 seconds. I could wake it up at the same time as everything else once a second rather than mm. a thousand times a second. So we can actually patch the applications to be 
always low power. So rather than saying you are now in a low power mode, do something different, we can right. say run by default in low power mode and only go into high power mode when you actually need it. Right. Because even though you're on AC, you still want to use more power than you need to. Yeah. I remember Matt Garrett presenting on that at Lug Radio a That's few where years I ago. That from. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And he was specifically saying that the Windows control panel for that was just ridiculously complicated because it expected mm. the user to take control of everything when actually he knew better on how to do it, so he may as well. <laughs> well they kind of have to win this. We can sort of poke fun at them, but they, they, haven't got, they can't go in and change Coral Draw to do something different. Uh, right. In the same way, on Windows, we could quite easily go into um, Scribus or Inkscape and say, look, you're being insane. You're updating the screen 40,000 times a second. Yes. Here's a patch to make you only update the screen 50 times a second. So we have great tools like PowerTop that lets us see how many times like a, an application or a process wakes up. Yes. And then we can, you know, file bugs and get the developers aware of that and then Basically patch name those. and shame. PowerTop exactly. is a great tool to name and shame developers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And and the net result is everyone wins. Exactly. You know. <laughs> um, do, do we ever need to expose that stuff in, in tools like Gnome Power Manager? Um, there is actually interface now. If you um, type in Gnome Power Statistics into the search bar, you get a little thing that comes up and you can click Processor Wake Up and it will actually tell you what programs keeping the system um, sort of... It's like a really simple version of PowerTop. PowerTop's great at telling you everything about what seat state you're in and all this kind of thing. But when you just want to know that some random Firefox plugin has gone crazy and is eating all your, all your CPU up, that's the thing that will tell you. Right. Now, for 3.6, we're probably going to be merging the, um, the, the battery device things in known power statistics. And also the wake up thing into the GNOME system tool, because it's really there's no point having two tools that are doing very similar things. Yes. So that's probably what happens for, for in the next few months. Oh, that'd be nice having it all in one place. Yeah, sure. It's le- and also less resources, and also, <laughs> also means I don't have to do a tarball release every month. <laughs> cool. Okay, I think we've uh, we've covered everything we uh, we wanted to. It's been uh, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Thank you so no much worries. for uh, spending time talking to us. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Cheers, then. Bye bye. 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 And now it's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Um, Mark Shotworth has blogged about some statistics showing Ubuntu overtaking Red Hat Enterprise Linux on public web servers over the past year. And Alan, you look like you've got some comment. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Ubuntu rules of the world. Does it? Well, it, if you zoom out, <laughs> then there are other Linux distributions are yes. available, yes. Um, but I think the highlight that he was trying to make is that, you know, whilst Red Hat was in a kind of downward direction on that graph and Ubuntu was on an upward direction, I think he wanted to highlight that uh, without highlighting the fact that Debian is like <laughs> <laughs> a mile above us. <laughs> and there's a load of other distros on that chart as well. I think uh, Stefano, the Debian project lead, has also blogged about it and uh, kind of zoomed out and showed a bigger picture as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was quite good fun, that. Mm. Plume, the developer responsible for the Getting Things GNOME task manager, has written a blog post entitled, What if Ubuntu were right? Discussing the switch to Unity and whether anyone other than geeks care about desktop environments. I suspect the answer is no. That's basically what it concludes. <laughs> yeah, it was, an, it was an interesting post. Hmm. Coming from the, uh, the, the point of view that actually maybe Ubuntu knows what it's doing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's a reasonable assertion because the, everyone else seems to think that this is completely meandering rubbish that we're doing and we haven't got a clue and you know we're mm. out to annoy everyone and we're just doing this stuff to irritate gnome and we're we're making change for change's sake and there's nobody leading this stuff and you know the, we get a lot of shtick about ubuntu uh, a unity specifically all the time and sometimes it is nice when someone takes a step back and says well you know look at the longer term maybe actually they are doing the right thing maybe it sort of comes from the conversation that we had about uh, Kubuntu being um, de-blessed. As a, <laughs> to use a no, it's still blessed. It's, it's still blessed. blessed. It's just not blessed. funded. Uh, yes. Defunded, then that's okay. slightly less, um, yeah, parochial. <laughs> um, yeah, as as an as a Ubuntu derivative, and yeah, all the eggs in one basket with mm. Unity. 
Which makes total sense. Yeah. If you if you've designed a desktop, if you've actually gone out and spent money getting designers and developers to create the desktop that you think is the thing of the future, it does make no sense to go and develop other desktops as well. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly KDE. It, it just makes logical sense <laughs> to me. But then I would say that because I work for Canonical. No, I agree. Yeah. Is it and I don't work for Canonical. <laughs> okay. It's an interesting blog post. Definitely. Um, a thread on the Ubuntu Devel mailing list has start, has been started to, to suggest the removal of Wubi, the Windows Ubuntu installer, from the 1204 live CD. That always makes me think of Willis Wodja. <laughs> <laughs> Willis Wodja? And Wadawick. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, the this is so that when somebody puts in the Ubuntu CD into a Windows CD, it comes up with a little thing saying, blah, you can reboot to a live CD or you can install Ubuntu from within Windows. Mm -hmm. And it does the repartitioning. No, it doesn't. No. Or does it? No. no. It no. installs it like it's an app. Yes. Yeah. It, installs it creates it. A, 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 a file, file, a disk image, yeah. That's the word I was after. Yeah. Mm. So why would we get rid of it? Um, well, it's not the most optimal way to install Ubuntu. I thought they were talking about still actually having it, but as a downloadable installer. Yes. So if you've already gone to the pain of getting an ISO image and burning it onto a CD, <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you then want a little Wubi executable on there? You know, you, the Wubi executable, the whole point of it is it's really easy. So the idea is you download an executable, you run it, and it prompts you, and then, blam, you've got an Ubuntu installation inside your Windows install. Mm. You know, that, that makes sense. But the use case where you've gone and downloaded 700 megs worth of of ISO image to run a 500k executable that sat on that yeah. it makes less sense yeah um, usually the biggest problem is you don't have a CD drive yeah well you could put it on a USB yeah you, know, you could go and download a piece of software that allows you to put that ISO image on a USB key <laughs> so that you could then plug the USB key in and run the 500k <laughs> executable that's on yeah it does, it just doesn't actually make sense I guess really. Windows users are familiar with the model of downloading an XE and clicking just running yeah. it I mean you might you might be given a set but that's the other thing if you order a CD from ship it you're well you won't now because we don't do ship it you know as much now um, yeah. you might get a CD at a um, a conference, but even then, the idea is you put the CD in and boot off it, and you know, get a decent install or a dual boot install with the you know partition disk and all that. So it's only five hundred meg. I don't know how big it is. But I was just making the point that it's rel relatively small compared yeah. to the size of an ISO image. <laughs> yeah, it's quite small. Former Kubuntu maintainer John Riddell has blogged about how KDE and Kubuntu, how the KDE and Kubuntu projects can remain relevant in the modern consumer software market. You mm. wrote that. I did, <laughs> and I can't even say it. Okay, how can they remain relevant in the modern consumer software market? Well, Mark? you can read his blog. <laughs> By being on tablets is the short answer. Let's yeah, that was part. He was talking right. about uh, Plasma Active, which yeah. is their new tablet um, interface UI, UI um, and Kubuntu has released a release for tablets. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah. yeah, it's the, the Plasma Active that's going to be used on the Vivaldi tablet that... Aaron Saigo has blogged about, which was called the Spark. Mm. And they've changed the name for legal reasons, I think. And he also talks about other things like, you know, making sure that um, sort of the KD libraries are interoperable so that they can, like, in the same way that um, Ubuntu now uses, well, it has Qt and you can have Qt apps on Ubuntu nice and seamlessly. He's talking about making it so that if you wanted to have some KD libraries included in the Qt stuff, you could do that easily. And yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Okay. The winners of the 1204 Ubuntu wallpaper contest have been announced, with 16 new photographic wallpapers being chosen for the upcoming release. Cool. That's good. That's very good. Mm. And they're pretty as well. That's even better. Yes. <laughs> That's always nice. They don't look like splodges of vomit on a purple background. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's an orange one that does a bit. Oh, no, he's a guitarist. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's some nice ones. There's like a, a real mix of, uh, of colour. And... Um, it's the, one of the ones that I really like isn't in the list, unfortunately. It's the the pangolin in a blue forest that I quite oh, that like. Quite nice, but it's probably a bit bit too dark for most people. I'm yeah. sure people uh, like bright, you know, upbeat. Whereas you can know. sit at home on your own in your den. In my dark den. Yes. <laughs> Listening to with the my, Smiths. With <laughs> <laughs> I love a bit of Morrissey on my desktop. Yes. Canonical have punished, pum, punished the Ooh. published the results of the recent Ubuntu user survey. And what do the results tell us? Um, that a lot of our users use Windows as well. Mm. More use Android than they use iOS. 
Ooh. Okay. Or of the people who actually responded. Um, and lots <laughs> of other statistics things. statistics head on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we've learned a lot from those that we, we couldn't probably have already figured out, really. Mm. Have we? Yeah, but it's about having the data. Yeah, true. As yeah, opposed true. to guessing at it. Well, okay, yeah. So what I mean is nothing is really massively nothing surprising. Said. We know we were right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what else does it say? Mm. Are we going to read oh, it now? Ubuntu One Usage. Oh, yes. It tells you about that. Cool. Are people using it? Uh, some are, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mozilla have been discussing including support for H.264 video decoding in its browsers, including the mobile-focused boot to Gecko platform by taking advantage of widespread hardware and OS support for the codec. Now, they originally said they were not going to do this and they were yes. going to support WebM. Yes. And they do. Yes. But nobody else does. No. Well, yeah, um, having read quite a few bits about this, essentially they were assuming that Google would as it said, it would basically drop H.264 support and make WebM the format for the the web video, but then they didn't, and now Mozilla are sort of out in the cold, and they can't really compete on mobile if they don't support the video hardware. And given that the video hardware, you know, if, if you've paid for a device with a DSP chip in which will decode H.264, then Mozilla aren't you know, exposing the user to like patent licensing by using that chip. Cause that was the thing they were always saying. They're not going to do anything which might then turn around and bite the user by making them have to pay fees for something they've included. But given that it's the hardware that's exactly. doing the Or if it's the underlying OS, if you buy a right. copy of windows, it, you you can, I think it has, Off it has H.264 support in as part of it. I think I can actually see your beard getting longer <laughs> while you were saying all I'm that. actually very happy about this news because this is one of my predictions uh, oh. in the last show. <laughs> you could have just said that. So as, you've got one right and I've had one come true. So. I can't even remember what mine were. Yeah. Keep listening till the end of the year and we'll let you know who's right. <laughs> And now it's time for your feedback. Jason Simmons commented on the website. The pie does have the potential to become flavour of the month. I think they're hoping that it will stir further in innovation. Who's old enough to remember the computing mag in newsagents called Input? It taught kids and adults to program on your Commodore 64s, BBCs and Spectrums. The pie guys have not even bothered to put it into a case so you can get into plastic mold injection. I think it's fantastic. Hmm. <laughs> I'm waiting for the white heat to die down and then I'm going to order a couple for my kids. Maybe that's why they didn't put a case on it because the white heat was just too much. Yeah. <laughs> I found a, I found a, an advert for one, a case on eBay. It was a, a fag packet with a hole poked in for a USB socket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you for that, Jason. Uh, we've had this voicemail come in. Hi, guys. Stephen from Ash to be alone a.k.a. Alpaca Herder on Twitter and otherwise a podcaster out in Ubuntu, Ohio land. Two quick things. One, glad to hear that uh, there's going to be an odd camp, and I just have to figure out how to afford to get there. Liverpool is quite a ways away from Ashtabula, Ohio. And secondly, with the Raspberry Pi discussion, all I can say to that is this. Curriculum drives. Before the hardware was ever released, there should have been a curriculum written. Teachers love having a model curriculum, and if they had that, they could do a lot. So with hardware first, it's going to be interesting. Time will tell. Have a good day, guys. <laughs> That's it. Press the button. Let us speak, Tony. Sorry, I wasn't quite sure what he finished. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he has a very good point. Uh, without a curriculum, it's just going to be a piece of circuit board in a room. Mm. But I mean, education wasn't the original intention for this. Yeah, it was. Really? Yeah, it, totally. it was supposed to be cla classroom based. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I thought it was just something that people and they keep picked put, up on. They keep uh. putting out videos showing, you know, Eben in a classroom showing people how to type Python, you know, on this kind of stuff. So, okay. Uh, yeah. It's going to be difficult. And so, I don't know, maybe part of the foundation will be build a curriculum over the summer holidays or something before September. Or, I don't know. <laughs> That's good quite luck. a dash. <laughs> good, good luck with that. 
Yeah. And finally, Ian McMichael wrote in to say... After four seasons, I thought it was time I finally sent you a contribution. Why today? Well, the release of Season 5, Episode 3 tomorrow or today if you're listening, or earlier, will also be my wedding day. The lovely Amy Ferguson may be an (laughs) almost on-topic comment just after her own wedding. As I'm marrying Debbie, she said we'd be the latest Deb Ian derivative. We're both happy Ubuntu users, so you could almost call it your first UUPC wedding. Aww. Aww. Well, I hope you have a very happy day. Deb Ian. And hope you'll be listening Oh, uh, tomorrow, yeah, yes. in the evening. In the yeah. evening. Yeah. Yeah, Nothing download do, the episode in the evening, yeah, on, <laughs> on your wedding day. You could play as a help on uh, the PA on the dance floor if you're having a do. <laughs> Have a little boogie. Maybe we should start doing weddings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got the wedding photographer, haven't oh, we? Exactly. Yeah. We've got our camp and things under our belt, yes. so let's, next step is surely weddings and corporate appearances. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, God. And that's all of your feedback. <sighs> That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Really trips off the tongue. Including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. <laughs> it's not, not plural, it's just one IRC channel. <laughs> Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Really just send in anything. And, we'll likely... <laughs> and we will play it. We are very likely to play it or we'll read it out <laughs> on the air. You can join us on Tuesday the 10th of April for our next live episode. Of pure quality edited to perfection. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we, do, we do this live. When we met all these Doctor Who podcasters over the weekend, they refused to believe that we did this live. They yeah. obviously haven't listened. <laughs> <laughs> they did think our URL was difficult to say. Ah, yeah, yeah. they're really going for the search engine optimization there. Anyway, yeah, good point. Thank you for listening and join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.